this is the Alden Star, their newest production here at Alden Marine. The wonderful boat, 18 feet long, specially designed for intermediate fast rowing, but not particularly really rough water. Has a little skeg on the bottom. And a slight dip in the stern. Doug Martin told me that the dip in the stern and the sheared off stern is to reduce hull drag, letting the water shear off away from the hull. This is the stern, very nice. These trains follow all the way right up to the bow, the same kind of little angle to them. This is the chining in the bow, same as the stern. This squared off stern detaches laminar flow, and the flat chines allow for clean laminar flow along the edge of the hull making the boat easy to get up on a plane without that much effort. It's a nice length, 18 feet. Here is one of the many Arlick kayak designs with the sheared off transom and the hollow stern to detach laminar flow. This is an old kayak in Okernovic. It's covered with sail skin. This is the bow section. This is a stern section. I am showing you in slow motion the shape of this Upernovic kayak. It's one of the typical examples and you can see how the bow and stern are tucked in. However, they're not as extreme as the ones you will see that are made by Nikolai Jensen in Kuslaswak, 165 miles north. Now I have moved on to Kuslaswak, Greenland, where kayaks are still used for hunting. These are two examples of Nikolai Jensen's kayak designs. And note that both the bow and the stern on these kayaks are greatly hollowed or tucked in. This is what allows these kayaks to be the fastest in the area. This is another one of his fast kayaks. And he does the same thing as the Geislers in Upernovic. He attaches the skeg through the keel. He does not use straps around the kayak for the skeg which would make it slower and noisier. These kayaks are actively used for whale hunting in this area of Kuslosok. The shape and displacement of the bow and the stern are the major factors in why this kayak will get up on a planing mode and stay that way. Now what's the stern of this kayak? It just pulls right under when he's fast. Look at that, it just disappears. Absolutely amazing. Now I'm showing you in detail what his kayak looks like as he's carrying it on his shoulder up the bank. And also his next door neighbor has the same shape and characteristic type of kayak. Very, very similar to what Lars has just demonstrated paddling for us. As in this kayak, which is a Bidarka, one to this by Darka is a George Dyson design, but originally it is a traditional Aleutian kayak. 
and it is covered with nylon filter cloth that has been impregnated and you don't have to worry about losing it overboard. Note the shape of this bifurcated bow and how the water comes off of this bow structure. It also has a squared off small stern which a fair way is to make the water run behind it with less disruption. So it acts with a squared off stern as though it were a much longer boat. I'm here in the Alutic Museum and we are looking at a reproduction kayak that Joe Kelly supervised its construction of. What I'm focused on is the bow. Now, Joe, the, the lower section of this bow is a one single carved piece. And this the grain follows the shape of the bow as close as possible for strength. Doesn't Correct. it? Yes. Yeah. So it's it's difficult to find just the right piece of wood. This is the most difficult piece in the boat, correct? Pretty much, yes. Yeah, yeah. Guess you have to do a lot of guessing. This bow piece that we were just looking at is, you said before, it's pegged in to... Well, there's, it's, it's like I said, it's sort of like a truss system. You have your uh, your uh, keelson, which, and then you have your bow plates, which run <coughs> the length and tie your uh, gunnels to your bow piece. They're pegged and also lashed. Uh, we use I noticed that the stringers are carefully fared in so that they, there is no uh, bumps in the surface of the boat where they feed into the bow. Right. Which is very important. Although this section would probably, unless they really were sticking out grossly, uh, the skin yeah. would be with all, yes, that's the right. The bottom, the lower stringers, of course, important. But the other two could be a little less careful, maybe. But yeah. although I don't think they were put in there sloppily anyway. The other thing, uh, there are surfaces on this to accommodate the fact that the skin must be able to drop. Now, along the top of the gunnels, there is a plate. It looks like a plate, this piece. Now this, I gather, would be to add volume to the bow in big waves. Well, that's one thing that it would do. The other thing is it ties the gunnels, the keelson, and the deck stringer all together. These two ah, plates yes. Yes. Uh, are part of that truss system I was talking about earlier that really add rigidity to the bow. Yeah. Yep. OK. Now the deck stringer, I find this fascinating um, that it goes and it follows the curve of the bow exactly all the way to the very tip. This I've never seen before. And I think part of the reason is, first of all, to let some air in, and second of all, to give structural integrity to the bow. Yeah. And the elliptic name for this piece, I can't remember it now, but it essentially literally meant the thing that you pick it up by or the thing that you hold it by uh -huh. it may have just been made for a simple function of carrying the boat. Yes, especially um, at the last minute, uh, let's say, grabbing it out of the water in and out. I would assume that would be very handy for that. These ribs are mortised into the gunnels. Yes. So they... It's about 30 ribs on this kayak. Wow. A lot more than the Greenland kayak. Correct. Many, many more. What I see that's very curious about these ribs is where they go into, where they are insert into the gunnel. 
It looks like there's a, a wrapping of sinew that starts there. Mm -hmm. um, oh, this is very di different than what I've ever seen before. Yeah, they, it's, uh, it's a continuous run of sinew all the way around. Oh, boy, that's amazing. Until the other side, and then it's tied off. Mm -hmm. You never tie to the gunnel, except you actually this whole mm -hmm. section of keelson ribs stringers becomes a unit this whole unit is attached to the upper gunnel yes at each deck beam okay send you a root lashing this unit to mm -hmm. this unit mm -hmm. the top unit is pretty much the bow piece the keelson I mean the uh, gunnels, yes. the bow plates, the stern piece, and the deck beams. That's really all one section. This becomes a sort of separate section, and it, it's lashed together. Uh, that's that's very interesting because what that means to me is that the boat, the bottom of the boat, is free to work in its own way with the water, and the top functions in a different way so they are separate from one another to which degree, is, yeah, that's yeah, correct. yeah it's basically built like a hand glider it's really strong as long as you keep it together yes and on the other hand it still uh, maintains a lot of integrity even if individual ribs get broken yeah it's not going to be the end of uh, the boat the, uh, because it's it's so many things all put together actually I heard of uh, a situation where a double, two men were whale hunting in a double close to Old Harbor, and the whale sounded. Uh, its wow, really? Fluke <laughs> yeah. hit a midship between the two paddlers oh, and no. uh, basically crushed the frame, but they were still able to paddle it to shore, oh, maybe no. a half a mile away. Wow. And. Uh, because it's like a. It was Kalitic Island until somebody figured out they were missing and came looking. Yeah, it's, it's like a biscuit. But it's designed so that the deck flexes a little differently than the bottom, yeah, which would give it, it would affect its character in the, in the seas. When you build the boat upside down, you basically put the gunnels, the, decks, the deck beams, the bow, the stern, uh, together as a unit flip it upside down and then you start adding the ribs. Once the ribs are in, you add the stringers and then you begin to lash it all together. I think one thing that's important about this boat is it is built to take many different types of sea conditions and absorb them each in the same way. So you can have a small sea where this bow will, with this, with the lower s section, which is meant for little waves, and then you have the increased buoyancy of the upper section of this bow, which is wider. The, the small seas act on the bottom of the hull, which is the most flexible part, and then when you get into larger seas, the gunnels start absorbing the wave stress. So that each part of the boat flexes with the kind of sea that it's in. And what I mean is the larger the waves, the different parts of the boat flex differently to take that into account. So that you're getting a boat that integrates with the water. Yeah, but that comes from them having spent their whole lives on the water, when you think about it. And years and years of experiments. You know, they just, I think, I think what they did was they just, they, they had years of, of experiments. And they figured out how to make something as seaworthy as possible. Because 
if a boat wasn't seaworthy and you went for a swim, it was your last. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's kind of curious when you think about the deck that it only has one stringer down the middle. But when you think about this boat, it doesn't need any more than just one, does it? Not really, no. That cockpit is very curious. Can you explain? There's two pieces involved in this one, I see. Um, there's a ridge on the inside, which I don't understand. I've never seen that before. In Greenland, I've not seen that. Do you know why they have a ridge on the inside of this cockpit? Well, that may, may again be just okay. the skin's not laying flat against it. It also may add strength, just yes. like uh, putting ridges in your corrugated metal, et cetera. It adds strength to it. could be a function of adding strength. This, of course, is sort of for your skirt to tie around. Yes, yes. Uh, this mm -hmm. lip. Is oh. that a scarf underneath um, on the outer, um, that, that wrapped joint yeah, on the midship? Should, yeah. Right. yeah, it's not a locking scarf, although I've mm -hmm. seen them use different kinds of scarf joints. Yeah, yeah. This is a slightly oval-shaped cockpit which is interesting. I was under the misconception that they were round. Some of them, many of them are. And uh, uh, I wouldn't, uh, I've seen, sort of seen both. The larger boats tend to have round hatches because when you're kneeling, you don't need as large a hatch. That's right, that's right. And so this, this may not be totally correct. But that's one detail that uh, has been hard to verify. The larger boats that we've seen, though, do tend to have round hatches. That's correct. But there's almost no documentation on the single other than Zimmerly's work uh, from, from uh, Denmark. Okay. So uh, we're a little unclear about the hatch, exact hatch. Dimensions. Dimensions. And Inuit people are very adaptive, so they often would change something. If someone had an idea, he'd just decide, well, I'm going to do it this way. I think this is better than the other way. Yeah. I've seen that many times. With the oval hatch, you still have more volume, but you don't, you don't take so much of the uh, width of the boat away. It's actually better uh, paddling because you don't have the, the lip of the cockpit out in an area where your arm is going to be brushing to yeah. when you're paddling. So, uh, yeah. I, I, you know, this, I sort of had to depend on Zimmerly on that. Yes. And, uh, his drawing. Yes. And interpolation. <laughs> yeah. So, but if that were a larger boat, I would say that it probably would be round. Okay. One of the doubles or hatch. Uh, the single hatch boat was called Kayanwak, which mm -hmm. meant lone. Kayak Puck was mm -hmm. the double, and Patalik was the three hatch boat. So they all three had different names. All three were kayaks, but, but had different sp specific yeah. names. Yeah. The Ribs, I was just noticing, are not just lashed in one direction, but to equalize the pressure, they lash them in the opposite way also. And you can see they cross over one way and then they crisscross the opposite way, which would make sense to sort of keep, keep things from moving one in one direction. You tie them down with stress one way and then you go back the opposite way to keep well, them that, in place. That, that could be, I think, uh, the reason we did it was more random. Ah, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, more okay, okay, planned. yeah. But yeah, it certainly could. Yeah. And I think the most simple part of the boat is actually the de the the string around the deck. It's really the deck string is about the simplest <laughs> solution for the problem. 
The stern is rather interesting. This is curious because the keelson extends completely back. And I've seen different uh, different ways of doing this. I've seen I've seen this piece be one. This is the bow. We're just blending in the keel, which mm -hmm. is the reason why we shaped it like this. Is what I found and the way the skin lies on this. Okay. It'll, like we were talking about before, it'll leave air passage through here. It'll keep the wood dry. Yes. And it's to find a really fine entry as well in the tracking. This is the area they are working on duplicating. You can see there's one, two, three, four pieces total. That's the bow plate, lower bow piece, and the upper bow piece. Look at that bow lift off key. To show you them bow on, the singles on the right side in black and the doubles on the left side in brown. This is the stern, just to show you the single is on your left and the doubles on your right. And this is the uh, stern piece that has been lashed together. It will be pegged down the center in a minute. And then he stitches them on to the bow piece. This is the area they are working on duplicating. But yeah. it's, really, it's really so very interesting because not the nail has been used to these kayaks. And but sometimes sometimes kayaks also go this yeah. side for the seal. Yeah. Oh, yeah. really? So carrying a seal on the neck. Yeah. This one is, this one is the standard that uh, Jose Peterson, the, when he published his book, uh -huh. this is the standard that we use. It sort of uh, it doesn't really belong to any location. Track very well. They're quite stiff. This kayak belonged to Hans Heilman. He could paddle from Nuuk to Manitsak in two days, a distance of 112 miles. He carried the mail from Nuuk to Manitzak in a kayak such as this in two days. I am at the museum at Aziat. This is a new kayak frame designed and built here. And behind it is a kayak built in 1935. The boats in this area are short and narrow for heavy sea conditions.